Hey everybody, it's Rothbard's Disciple here, and this is just a quick add-on before the actual video begins. Uh, this video is kind of weird because uh, I'm showing you as a product that I've been trying to work on for a while. Um, if you actually, like, part of the video is going to be reading part of a, the story, or the first scene of the story that I've told you guys that I've been writing. Um, it's a sci-fi fantasy story. Um, this, the... This is the first scene of the first season, and the first season is supposed to be like 20 episodes or so, so like 400 or 600 pages for the entire season. Um, and I've had to rewrite it a lot, so this is not at all um, yet, com it's not completed yet, um, but I just wanted to show you guys the first scene. Um, and so if you guys want to look at that uh, right away, that's at 37 minutes. It will help you to understand the rest of the video, and I will mention it again at like 11 minutes, it, you might want to read the story at 11 minutes as well. So maybe you just wait until 11 minutes to read the story. Maybe you read it now and then you read it at 11 minutes as well. Um, but this video is a little bit different and that's just because this video is very difficult to make. Um, but I hope you guys enjoy it. Um, there, will be, there will be more videos coming out soon. Uh, this video just took so long because it was just so difficult to make. Hey everybody, it's Rothbard's Disciple here and I'm bringing you guys a video today. This video is uh, sort of difficult for it was difficult for me to create um, so if you understand it like uh, let me know because <laughs> uh, I put a lot of effort into this and I'm not saying like lie and tell me you understood it if you did or not but uh, or, or like don't tell me you understood it if you didn't but uh, you know if you did understand it let me know because uh, I can make different things sort of like this in the future. I can't do this all the time, but just every now and again when there's a need that arises. And the need that arises, uh, that, uh, or the need that made me want to make this video uh, is the fact that most people have smart contracts backwards. Uh, they think the smart part of the smart contracts is the contract itself. Um, and if you look back at the history of business, business has always been a history of contracts, but it's not the writing of the contract that is important. Okay, so Ethereum has it backwards. It's not the, the contract itself that is smart. It's the people behind the contract that are smart. So smart contracts are basically meant to be done, you know, off-chain as just regular business, okay? Um, and for some reason, Vitalik Buterin uses this communist style um these communist definitions where he says like a business is a centralized structure um, you know you voluntarily choose whether or not you go to a business or not so uh, you know yeah a business owner has control over his business um, but that's not a bad thing control and power is not e equal to evil um, so there's this big I used to call it the soy boy problem that's a really unprofessional way to call it or to to name this problem but it's a it's it's the problem to be honest um, it's people who don't want control and don't want to take leadership and the entire ethereum community like if you just look up some of the pictures on Vitalik Buter and like I really Vitalik's a smart guy but man he should not be a leader <laughs> I'm just telling you uh, if you look at some of the pictures of him you know He's uh, he's an interesting character. I'm not sure I would, you know, he I, I think he would probably not be a threat to anyone ever, which is why one reason why I don't think he should be a leader. But two, I think some of the people who he might be friendly with might be a little bit uh, a, a little bit off in very um, weird ways. Uh, he he has some odd views of you know child pornography and. I feel like some of his friends could be kind of nefarious people, I guess, would be one way to say it. But, uh, you know, the soy boy problem, it, it's an actual problem into the way that these people are trying to code their software. And you, it's sort of evident in the way that Vitalik Buterin thinks of these smart contracts because to him it's just, you know, automating things like payments, um, trying to, you know, there's a bunch of ICOs built on top of Ethereum that are trying to basically automate things like, you know, the internet and all these sorts of things. Uh, one thing that we've seen with, or like, you know, exchanges as well. Uh, one thing that we've seen with them, like with Bancor, uh, which was supposed to be a decentralized exchange, is that you can still get your funds stolen and the bank still has a kill switch. So it's no different than a normal bank. Um, it's except now it, you've introduced all these uh, complexities into the coding of the software uh, that you're using, and so it's it's like a normal bank, but it's a lot more complex and l a lot less secure. So it's really kind of a stupid trade-off. Um, but this is the Ethe what Ethereum's trying to do, um, and I I see this not as like a revolutionary technology. I see this as a reaction of 
you know, spineless, uh, you can call them men, you know, they've got, they've, they've got the parts to be men, but they don't, they don't act like it, and I, they just want to avoid leadership, so they try and say, hey, we're going to automate everything, but that's not the way the world works. So the, the way you build smart contracts on Bitcoin is, it's just a contract where you say you're going to do something, and then you do it. And now the weird way that Bitcoin works is that you can actually catalog this as you go, and so this allows you to catalog your IP rights to uh, a certain digital good as you create it. But the way Bitcoin works is, uh, and this is the one thing that all the anarchists are getting wrong about it, and like this is why I keep saying like all the anarchists all the anarchists within this movement are moving very hard towards communism is because Bitcoin is uh, beyond its ability to like be used as money. It's also a tool that allows you to appropriate intellectual property. And all the anarchists like they scream and they hiss and you know, you know they get <laughs> basically they all start having their period when you start talking about intellectual property rights. And uh, the one thing that the anarchists are correct on is that currently. Uh, bef like before Bitcoin, most of intellectual property was invalid. Um, just like uh, the, the way I like in Bitcoin is Bitcoin is like a tool for mining intellectual property. So before you had industrial mining equipment, you like you couldn't say you own the, the, the ground or the earth that is miles deep beneath the surface. OK, that makes no sense. Like if you're a Native American, you can't say I own all the ground that's one mile beneath the surface from here to there. Um, because you can't access it, so it's not a valid thing for you to say that you own. And so that's the one thing that the anarchists get right, is they're like, hey, look, the vast majority of IP rights aren't really valid because you can't really appropriate IP. Um, but then what, what the anarchists get wrong about Bitcoin is... Uh, Bitcoin's just a tool to allow you to appropriate IP, so it's like mining equipment. So once you have industrial mining equipment and you can actually dig mines miles deep within the interior of the earth, it is valid to say that a certain individual owns parts of the earth miles deep within or bit below the surface. Okay, so that's all Bitcoin does to IP. Now, the the other thing that's true about this is it's just like owning different parts, like uh, appropriating different parts of the earth. It's Lockean in nature. So you have to distribute or you have to display some sort of uh, um, ownership of it through your labor so you you gain ownership over over it by doing something to it so uh, the way that this shows up actually in Bitcoin is the proof-of-work system so if we're talking about the money of Bitcoin the proof-of-work system is just people showing ownership of what the valid chain is by what's the longest proof-of-work chain that's why Bitcoin BTC still has a valid claim to the title of Bitcoin um, if Bitcoin cash ever gets the longest proof-of-work chain then BTC basically never has another claim to the title um, but as of right now BTC does have a claim to the title because it's the longest proof of work chain and so it, it that's the way you add validity to the money part of bitcoin but if you're building a smart contract the way you build a, uh, the way you build smart contracts on bitcoin is you catalog your intellectual property rights and again because intellectual property rights with bitcoin it's just like mining gold out of the ground you can only display ownership of you know the the ground or the earth if you're actually building a mine there you know you have to actually be doing something there otherwise you can't say you own it so with bitcoin when you actually are building smart contracts on bitcoin to build a business out of your intellectual property you only own uh as much of it as you have put uh, labor into it. And so the the way you catalog the, your labor into it is you uh, catalog the edits that you do onto the blockchain. And so I'm going to show you guys uh, a smart contract that I've been trying to build for three years on and off. And I think this one smart contract alone is uh, more interesting than the entirety of everything that's being built on Ethereum. Just because if you take the... Uh, implications of the smart contract and then you, you expand on it to to realize that not only can I build a smart contract this big but you know millions of people can build smart contracts this big and if if I complete the smart contract um, I will become a billionaire with a B <laughs> um, so it's a big one um, and you can put millions of these on the Bitcoin blockchain so the entirety of what Bitcoin smart contracts can do dwarfs you know what Ethereum and their Ethereum smart contracts are basically automatic bill pay that's basically all it is I can already get that at my bank I'm pretty sure it's free um, but Ethereum's not anything revolutionary. So the smart contract that I've been working on and off for three years, uh, so it's more like, you know, maybe one year of actual work, um, and a lot of that's, you know, spinning my wheels. But uh, anyways, uh, the smart contract I've been working on, on and off for three years, is I want to kill Disney Corporation, okay? 
I want to kill Disney Corporation. Now, a lot of you guys are going to be like, well, you must be a really good programmer if you want to kill Disney Corporation and you want to do it by using a smart contract on Bitcoin. Uh, the truth is I can't program at all and I don't need to do it in order to fill the smart contract. So I'm going to show you guys how to do it. So it's actually a lot easier, or sorry, it's a lot easier than you would actually think. So uh, we have to remember back to the Merkle roots and... Uh, hash tables that we talked out about before. Just so you guys know, a hash table is just uh, where you take uh, a bunch of items and you hash these items together so that uh, you keep hashing each hash together so after each round of hashing you have half as many hashes until you're, you're left with one final hash. And that final hash is the hash of all the other hashes hashed together. Okay, so uh, the reason why you do this is because if any of those individual items ever get changed and you have or if, if any of those items get changed at all, uh, it changes the final hash. Uh, and so then this allows you to verify the authenticity of files, like of billions of files in you know a few milliseconds uh, with only a couple of calculations. It's, it's, really, it's really great for scaling. Um, and so this is really big for businesses. Like let's say, uh, you know, if I'm trying to kill Disney Corporation, it means I'm going to have to put as many digital items onto the blockchain as, you know, somebody like Disney Corporation would. And that could be, you know, like billions of items a year. Um, so it's a lot of throughput here. But anyways, uh, or it's a, not only a lot of throughput, but if you want to verify the authenticity of you know, one individual work of Disney, like let's say you're, you're buying a DVD and you want to make sure it's the actual Disney DVD, uh, you can hash that, and if the hash comes out correctly, then you can say, hey, yep, this is the legit copy of Disney's uh, DVD, cause you, because you know that not only is the hash the same as that particular movie's hash, but when you check that particular movie's hash against all the work that Disney has ever done, uh, you can verify that movie against all the previous work that Disney has ever done within a, a matter of milliseconds, you know, even if Disney has billions of works uh, posted to the blockchain, and uh, it's really easy to do. So uh, Merkle Roots are just a great thing, but the way that, you know, for any programmers out there, the way it would look for the user is it would look something like this. Like, it doesn't have to look exactly like the way files are shown within a... Uh, within Ubuntu, but you know it just has to be some sort of drop-down table thing. So you have root hashes, so uh, my main root hash would be this folder that we're in right now. It's actually a folder titled All Scripts. Um, this is my main root hash. It would have all these files in it uh, within them, and as you can see, uh, most of these scripts here, uh, they're standalone scripts, so they're just movie scripts. Uh, movie scripts are just like 120 pages. Um, Luther is not complete yet. I've got that one like 80 pages in. But it's really hard to finish a story. It's really hard to get a story with Superman and put Superman in real danger. So it's that's a tricky story to write. Uh, the story on the top right is going to trigger a couple people. It's titled The Noble Nazi. Uh, it's actually a decent story, but I'm only like 10 pages into it. Um, it's more of a story that exists in my head. Um, I actually want to have a different name. I want the name of the story to be in German, but I don't really know German, so I just left it as that for right now. Um, but uh, uh, you can also see I have a story called The Wrestler that uh, that one's basically ready to, you know, show to somebody. But as a writer, if you write TV or if you write movie scripts, uh, one script is not all that much work, so people don't really look at you unless you have multiple movie scripts. Um, but anyways. This is what my uh, r initial root hash would lead to. You'd get all these standalone scripts and then Infinity. And as you can see, Infinity is a folder as well. So Infinity would come, like it would have its own drop down that would lead to a bunch of leaves. And if we um, actually want to look at this uh, in a little bit more detail here, um, if you we or what what I have in Infinity, uh, there's two separate things. Is I have the scripts for Infinity, the story arcs. So um, right here is the list of all the story arcs for Infinity. Um, as you can see, there's six six different uh, story arcs. Um, they all or some of them kind of converge on each other, like uh, Giselle Corona, Kachawi, Victor Cruz, and Siana. They all converge on each other. Um, so, it, you know, it starts off as, like, four different story arcs, and then it turns into, like, three different story arcs. But anyways, um, each one of these folders has about 20 different pages in them that are about seven pages uh, long, or, or 20, 20 or so different scenes in them that are about seven pages long. So if we look at this one right here, this is the uh, story of... Uh, 
Kupenga and Kimwan, uh, Kimwan Zalishi. <laughs> um, those names might sound a little weird. That's because they're based off uh, like Swahili words. Um, I, the K at the start has nothing to do with Swahili, but uh, the, the names sort of uh, reference different Swahili words. But anyways, um, within uh, like each one, of, like I said, each one of these uh, scripts is uh, it's a couple pages long. Um, and actually, uh, at the end of this video, uh, you guys can skip to it right now if you want to. Um, but I'm going to include the uh, first scene of this. Uh, of my sci-fi fantasy story so you guys can actually get sort of a, an idea of what I want done for my story just so you can visualize how blockchain smart tra contracts are supposed to work but as you can see like if you go back and you look at how many folders I have I have six main folders here like I said two two of the story arcs converge onto one so it's actually supposed to be like uh, actually a couple of the story arcs converge together but it, it's actually supposed to be like three main story arcs, um, and each of them are supposed to have like 22 scenes with like seven to ten pages for each scene. So if you if you do that math there, you're supposed to have somewhere between like you know 400 to 600 pages, and I'm gonna end up with like 500 pages. And when you actually are writing something, just so you guys know, when you're not writing nonfiction, like when you're writing fiction, the majority of what you do is rewrites. I'm on my third rewrite right now, and I know for a fact at least this story arc, the story arc that. I have shown right here. Um, there's quite a few things that I need to change, um, and that's going to continue. So this isn't like a completed thing. But again, this is all the work that I have uh, that is moving towards, uh, or for the script. Again, this is the story. This is the actual story uh, that I think uh, you know is a better story than Star Wars. It's the same sort of type of like a sci-fi fantasy story. Um, it takes a lot, sort of, from like you know. Uh, different decent anime stories like uh, Naruto or Dragon Ball Z, and I know people are going to say there's some serious weaknesses in those specific um, those specific shows, but uh, I'm saying you take the good from them and you leave the rest. But anyways, um, uh, beyond these stories, and like I said, if you want to actually read uh, one of the scenes from one of the stories, I'm going to put actually the death of Khan Zalishi. It's actually Kumwan Zalishi is his name. Um, like I said, I got to rewrite this. There's a bunch of mistakes and different like proper names that I've changed over over time. But uh, that first scene I'm going to have right at the end of this video. Um, so if you want to see it, just go ahead and fast forward and get to that and uh, see if you like it. Alright, so now whether or not you actually read the story um, for this next part, like it, it'll help you to understand a little bit if you did read the story, but if you didn't read it, like don't feel terrible. Um, it's also kind of weird posting your own personal work out publicly on YouTube. Um, it's always it's always a little weird. Uh, but anyways, um, now I'm going to show you guys some of the merchandise that you can sell with that story. So obviously if you've only read four pages, that's not enough to know whether or not you would like the story. But again, it's just the idea of you're going to create some sort of like animated television show like Dragon Ball Z or Naruto or Star Wars or something like that that you know kids sort of like, that sort of action-packed, like fighting, fighting style stuff. But... Uh, uh, that's the kind of idea of the story you want to create. So um, even you guys, the one thing you guys got to remember is even uh, if my story doesn't sell, someone can take my story and alter it in some way. And if if they want to sell that altered story, they can do it, uh, and they can very easily just be like, "Hey, I want to take your story and just alter a couple things in it." Like maybe they just don't like a few. Um, you know, critical scenes in the in the first season that would change the outcome of the entire show. So they want to rewrite the show after changing a couple seasons or some or changing a couple episodes in the first season, which changes all the episodes thereafter. You know, and they want to write their own show. Like I am, I think that's totally fine. Like the one thing you guys got to remember is, for me, the perfect the perfect expression of intellectual property laws are the way Bitcoin for forks work and that you have to just have work behind the chain for it to be valid um, so that's why you know a lot of people call Bitcoin BTC the actual Bitcoin chain because it does have the longest proof of work chain so that's a really um, you know that's a really good sign that it is the real Bitcoin as of right now um, if Bitcoin Cash ever gets more proof of work it'll be hard for Bitcoin BTC to ever say it's the real Bitcoin again just because of other flaws that BTC now has but uh, um, Anyways, uh, my view on intellectual property is that it should be handled in that exact same way. So, you know, that the story that I showed you, um, not only, like, 
not like I, I want to sell merchandise with that story, but if I fail, someone can change the story and they can keep the same type of merchandise with that story and they can sell it. And uh, all they do is include a small fee that would go to me. Um, and again, that's just because they would be actually using the files that I have put on the blockchain because all these files that I hash and I put on the blockchain, um, I also put in some sort of uh, file distribution center that allows people uh, who I grant access to actually look at it and edit those files. And if they edit those files, then they can then be granted some sort of ownership over the entire project. You know what I mean? And so that's how this entire system works. Um, but when we actually look here, uh, if we go uh, not to look at um, the uh, s not to look at the scripts themselves, but to look at the backstory of the sort of stuff that I have for this uh, for Infinity, it actually gets very elaborate here. So I'm going to open up a couple things here. Uh, the first one that we're going to look at here is uh, just conquest. So the the conquest one again. I've shown you guys a couple of these before. I'm gonna open a couple of these. I'm not gonna talk about them. But this one's just a card game that actually you play. It's a card game similar to, um, it. it I don't know. It's like a Star Wars duels if you ever played that. But you have characters that are gonna be on the board that move around and attack each other. Um, it could be almost seen. Uh, like almost similar to I think Warhammer there's some sort of game that you play uh, with actual characters on a board I don't know if it's Warhammer um, but they have like really expensive um, figurines for it and stuff um, I, whoever actually plays it they're gonna hate me for not knowing the actual name for it but anyways um this is just a tabletop game where you, you just have characters that battle it out right so uh, this is one product that can be sold with a sci-fi fantasy game, and this game gets actually really cool for people because you get to do like a galact you can do galactic, or sorry, galactic conquest style stuff, where you have like one team tries to, you know, control the galaxy and take over the galaxy from another team, or if you know the galaxy is too big, maybe you just take over small sectors of the galaxy at a time or something like that. Like there's a lot of cool things that you can do with something like this. Um, but like I said, I have other videos on this, so we're not going to go too far into the uh, Galactic Conquest. The one thing that I haven't shown you guys are these uh, maps here. So <clears throat> not only do I have characters for this board game, but I have maps that you could use. Um, these are just basic ideas for maps. Um, some of them, you know, uh, some of them have different like little base style areas. Some of them have a bunch of uh, obstacles in the way. Some of them have things such as water. Um, there's a lot of different styles here. The, these maps, I know they look kind of like complete crap and they don't give you much information. I made these in a couple minutes just to give a general idea of what different style maps could look like. But again, so th this Conquest game, again, it doesn't even have to be fitted with this specific story, but there is a you have a basic skeleton for a game already built for you, um, and all you, you know you can change any of the uh, individual parts like if you go back to those characters if you don't like the uh, abilities that the characters have you can change them if you don't like the names of the characters you can change them you know if you if you do like the names of the characters and stuff but you think the story behind it is crap you can take the you can take the game conquest and you can just alter the story and then you know run it that way uh, again because you use you post this to a blockchain uh, now your ideas and the businesses you create with your ideas can be hard forked like like cryptocurrencies are and as long as there's people willing to you know support it um, then it can exist as its own business, and it's really kind of a crazy thing if you think about it. Um, if we go back to this backstory, though, beyond the conquest, and just so you guys know, each one of those, uh, if we go and look at this conquest thing here, each one of those uh, uh, individual items here is supposed to be, it's supposed to lead to uh, three separate characters each. Um, some, of the, some of them are undone. Each of the ones that say one to three are unfinished. Uh, those ones are unfinished as of right now. So I have like 13 finished, which is 13 different species with three characters each. So that's like 39 plus the four odd extras that I have. So it's a lot of characters for a board game. It's more than enough to actually, you know, start this board game and, you know, actually test it out. Um, but um, going back to this backstory, uh, beyond what I have for Conquest there... Um, there's two more that I'm not going to look at. One's Infinity Coin Applications. Again, each one of these folders, like I said, since we're, we would post these to a blockchain, they're just a root hash. The Conquest one is everything about the board game Conquest that I showed. The Infinity Coin Applications is just an idea for, like, if you were to use some sort of tokenization to run a business that did this, uh, maybe you would, 
use that, but I'm not so sure about about that exactly. Um, I don't really enjoy uh, the way most people use the term tokenization. I don't think it really means um, much at all, and it, I don't think it means what they're trying to say. Um, but so we're, so we're not going to talk about Infinity Coin. The maps, uh, that's supposed to be galaxy maps, and I don't really have good galaxy maps right now. Um, but if, we, if you go into the uh, planets and moons, so uh, like I said, there's a bunch of different species for this uh, story that I have. And again, if you're going to compete with Star Wars, Star Wars has hundreds of species, so you got to have a lot for yourself. Uh, for the planets and moons, um, again, this would be just uh, another one of the root hashes within the root hash for my backstory. So I have this one root hash that has all of my life's work. Within that, one of the one of the hashes in that is um, the backstory for an infinity. And then within the hash that has the backstory for an infinity is my hash for the planets and moons. So if we look at this, um, all the planets and moons that I have, uh, it, it's really quite impressive here. There's, uh, you know, I'm, I'm it's around 30 or something, 30 or 40. There's quite a bit. I don't know exactly the entire amount, but we're just going to look in and show you exactly what each one of these planets has behind it because there's actually quite a bit of work behind it. Um, the whole point of all this information behind the planets and moons is that it would be organized in some sort of like galaxy um, or like guide to the galaxy um, sort of book. Um, and so if you want to have a book that tells you all about the planets, you have to have some basic information. So the first thing I have on these planets, this planet right here is uh, called Bosphora. Um, it's pretty similar to something like Coruscant. It's like a, it's an ecumenopolis, which is a city planet. Uh, pretty close. The standard mass, standard units. That's just uh, in comparison to like the Earth. So one, the planet size when it says 1.29 standard mass, it means 1.29 times larger than Earth. Distance from Sun, uh, 1.08 standard units. So 1.08 times what the Earth is. Um, and I know that doesn't really make sense because it's supposed to be a galaxy far away, but that's just what I use uh, for it. But uh, anyways, um. So you see all this basic information about the planet, and you see a picture of kind of what the planet looks like down on the planet side of it. But there's also this information about it, uh, and I'm not going to read this information for you. You can read it yourself if you want. But each one of these planets, uh, you know, it has its own backstory, its own way of life, its own people, its own ethos. And I know a lot of people who watch this, they're going to be like, oh, I hope you made each one of these people, like each one of these species, a group of anarchists. And, you know, the truth is, no, <laughs> there's a, there's a two groups, I think, of like what you could call anarchists, one group of anarcho-capitalists and one group of anarcho-communists within the entire galaxy. And like I said, I think I have, you know, between like 40 or 30 to 40 planets and like 20 to 30 species. So, and, and this group, these two groups that I made, they're supposed to be like outcasts, like they, they don't really belong. So I, I've always taken a to Tolkien approach to uh, story making in that you don't ever write allegory, you just write things the way they are, um, and anarchy is not really the way the world is. Just the, That's just the way it is, um, so I don't, I don't really include it in my story basically whatsoever. But again, this is just uh, showing you... Uh, again, if you go back and you look at all those planets, for each one of these planets, I have uh, usually about one page written for each planet. For some pages, or for some planets that are more important, I could have two to three pages, but it just kind of depends on the planet. And again, like I said, there are a lot more planets that I need to create, um, so there's a lot more of this that I need to put onto the blockchain. But again, if you look at this, all this information in totality again, um, we've now gone through where I show you guys that card game I have. I've shown you guys uh, the planets that we have. Uh, all the planets for this uh, um, for this galaxy, and one reason why having all these planets is big is because, like, if you have a story uh, within this um, sci-fi galaxy, and like, let's say you need uh, like the heroes or whatever, they really need some sort of fast smuggling ship to in order to get to get behind enemy lines or something, something with like a bunch of cloaking devices. If you have all this backstory for all these planets, and in each one of these planets, like I give them some sort of uh, thing that they specialize in for industry or finance or whatever it is um but it, it, like let's say you have them and they need to have the best cloaked stealth smuggling ship 
uh, in order to get behind enemy lines, you know which planet it should already come from. So it makes making your story that much easier. But uh, moving even on from just planets, uh, we can move on to the species that I have here. Um, so if you look at this list of species, uh, it's quite extensive. I have like 36 or something. I don't know if those are all finished. I would assume they aren't. Um, so there's probably like 33 finished species here. Um, <clears throat> that's a lot of different species. Um, so if, if you want to actually look into uh, each species individually here, one of the species that I'll show you here, uh, this is one of the species that I actually have less written on, but this is the Valkari of Kubaga. Uh, they look basically like big, huge apes. They live on a planet with really massive gravitational pull. So they have a really thick skeleton, and they also have like high, like their armor. Uh, you know, they, they basically have like horns or whatever material horns are, it's like made as armor around their body, so they have a really thick skeleton, but they almost have like an exoskeleton as well, but they're just a very strong species. Um, but like I said, for each one of these like 33 species that I have finished here, I have uh, basically a page written about the species just like this, and one thing that I actually want to get uh, written on all these species is I want to have like their... Uh, their size and different stats about the species but again for each one of these species as you can see we're building up a pretty good um, skeleton for a story and especially if you consider like uh, you know I'm, I'm making this for a sci-fi fantasy story um, but you could actually change some of the things in this story uh, and you know you could change the species and just downgrade the technology and just be like hey I like this idea but I want to make it for you know instead of a sci-fi futuristic story I want to make it some sort of old time magical mediev medieval story and they could do that as well again you gotta remember when you post something like this to the blockchain anybody can fork it in any way they want so long as they like the basic ideas that you've been putting up there they can just be like hey I'll give you some certain percentage of future profits if you let me u utilize your work and again this is all done contractually actually on the blockchain and this is how the blockchain allows you to extract intellectual property um, basically from things that used to be hard to transact with or to trade intellectual property that used to be hard to trade because you used to not be able to ever do this um, uh, but again if we go back then to, to all the different things I have in this backstory there's more than just you know uh, that card game there's more than the planets and moons there's more than the species I also have technologies and uh, you might think that uh, these technologies uh, that I have that I don't actually put that much work into it because it's a sci-fi fantasy story so I just sort of make things up as I go but I actually try and make these things sort of uh, I call it pseudoscience. I try to make the pseudoscience pretty accurate. So the pseudoscience isn't completely accurate science, but uh, for any of the technologies I have, I try to make it as accurate as I possibly can so that at least if there's a scientist watching, they'll be like, well, that's not how it works, but it's at least close enough, you know what I mean? Um, but there are certain things within this sci-fi fan fantasy universe that you can't explain. The good news is, is there's, this, there's also this uh, magical power, which would basically be like... Uh, the Force uh, in Star Wars, or Chi in Naruto. Um, I think in Dragon Ball Z they just call it energy. Um, you know, if it was a medieval story, it would just be called magic. But because there's this magical energy within the universe, um, you can actually create certain sort of fantastical um, technologies and just say they're powered by that magical force. So that allows you to um, sort of... Uh, it allows you to make your story a little more fantastical, but one of these fantastical um, technologies that I have, it's uh, particle crystal technology, so I'm actually going to show all these pages on the screen for you. If you want to pause it and read it for yourself, you can. Um, it might not make that much sense to you because it's pseudoscience, and this is me, something that I've written quite a while ago, just that's you know pseudoscience uh, pretending about how you would actually create a particle beam and make a weapon out of a particle beam. And just so you guys know, a particle beam is not actually something that can exist in nature. Um, a particle beam is just, it's like a... A, a, a beam of light that can, uh, or at least the way I use it in my story, I don't even know if I'm using all the physics terms correctly, but the way I use the particle beam in my story is that it's a beam of light that can <clears throat> combine with regular matter to make compounds. And so this is very interesting because, you know, normally light doesn't, like it can bounce off matter, but it doesn't actually combine with light to make compounds. So if you can make compounds with light, then you can basically make like, or the way that I say that the particle beams are used uh, within the story is that they're used for weaponry for the most part so you make particle or you make a particle beam that binds with matter usually super hot plasma 
uh, which is, you know, got a lot high thermal and electrical energy, and it binds with that, and so then it shoots off like a beam of light in that it shoots off very quickly, and there's no drop in the bullet whatsoever, because, you know, light, for the most part, isn't affected by gravity. I know it is slightly, but for the most part, it's not. Um, but anyways, uh, uh, you can actually have a weapon like that. But the, the way that I say that the particle bullet is created uh, in the story is it's just that for some reason you have this uh, magical crystal called the particle crystal that whenever it gets filled up with plasma energy it creates a particle beam. But particle beams, again, like I said, they're just photons that can bind with matter. Um, that's an anomaly in nature. You can't have that. So for some reason I just say, the, for some reason the particle crystal it immediately binds the particle beam to the plasma within the particle crystal so the, the particle beam never actually exists and then when the particle bullet loses energy and it can no longer sustain the uh, new molecular compound that was created and it degenerates into just uh, you know a particle beam again and the plasma the particle beam immediately dissipates um, and so there's actually you know a sort of a pseudoscience behind it and so again for any of you who actually know physics I sorry for all the butcher I'm sorry for all the butchering I did here um, um, but all I'm trying to show here is that for all these technologies that I have, and if you look at the technologies, there's quite a few different things in here. Some of them are pretty similar, like obviously particle weaponry is similar to the particle swords and sabers. Um, but each one of these things, there's quite a bit of work behind it. And if you look at all this together, uh, you can understand, well, okay, it's pretty obvious here that you can go from one of two directions. Uh, either, like, you know, if someone wants to help you continue the story, they, they have a lot of the, the skeleton to work from, and they can know basically where you're trying to go. Or two, if they sort of like parts of your story but think other parts are bad, they can take the parts that they like, turn it into something of their own, and then uh, since this was all posted on the blockchain, they can just say, hey, I'm taking this part from your story and utilizing it in mine. I'm going to give you future profits on, you know, how I used your story in my story. And it's like, boom, done. Very easily, all very cheaply, all for a couple cents on the blockchain. But again, this is how smart contracts to me are supposed to be created. Um, they're supposed to be contracts where the person behind it is actually the one who's smart, who's doing really incredible things. It's not supposed to be some automated thing, uh, you know, where it relieves all people involved of all responsibility. That's not how business works. Business requires a man in charge. And if you don't like it, you know, I'm sorry, you just have to deal with it. But um, I hope this video made a little bit of sense to you. It's really, it was kind of hard for me to make. Um, and it took me a while to make. That's why I haven't had any videos come out in a while. Um, I'll have some more videos coming out here soon. Because um, I'm not going to try and make videos this hard for a while. But uh, I, I hope this sort of helped explain to you that, again, smart contracts are not smart because the contract itself is smart. They're smart because the person behind... Uh, fulfilling the contract is smart and that's the way Bitcoin smart contracts are supposed to be made they don't do the smart part on the blockchain okay they do the smart part part off the blockchain why because that's where businesses exist they exist they exist off the blockchain but again I hope you enjoyed this video there will be more coming out soon okay so just in case you guys were uh, confused at all um, like I said in the beginning of this video right at 37 minutes or right around 37 minutes is when the uh, script starts so if you want to read the script and then you want to go back and watch the video again to see if you can understand how you could try and kill Disney Corporation or at least the Star Wars arm of Disney um, using all this information uh, you know whether or not you want to work on this script itself and these products themselves or if you want to alter it for your own creation um, it should start making a little bit more sense but yeah if you want to read that script just mute the video go to 37 minutes and then pause at each page it's only four pages and scripts are it's a lot easier to read a script than it is to read a regular paper um, but again a script is also supposed to be it's like a blueprint so it's not like a book it's not like the most interesting thing in the world but again this is just the type of information I would give to people who I'd want to work with me um, so I uh, again I hope uh, this helps explain things I hope you know maybe this video if you watch it a couple of times maybe you'll start understanding what I said or what I'm trying to say and what I'm trying to explain uh, with the points I make in this video. But like I said, just mute it, go to 37 minutes, and then read the script.